Cartesian dualism is the idea that two kinds of things exist in the world. There is matter that includes the physical universe, my body, my glasses, this teddy bear, this piece of paper, and there is mind, the th my thoughts, my feelings, my soul, my consciousness. The question or problem that we are dealing with here is, am I just a brain or do I have a mind? And is there a difference between brain and mind? And this relates to a larger question of existence, like what am I? What are you? Are you your thoughts or are you a physical entity? And can you be sure of the existence of anything outside of your own thoughts? Now these are profound uh, philosophical questions which are beyond my skills to answer. But what I'm going to do today is uh, try to explain the term dualism so you could use the word when you're talking to anthropologists and anthropologists would understand you. So basically what do anthropologists mean when they're talking about dualism? And primarily they refer to an enlightenment, that is 1700s Europe, an enlightenment philosopher named Descartes and his idea that two kinds of things exist, thinking things and non-thinking things. In other words, mind and matter. And the term that's sometimes used from the word Descartes, we get Cartesian. So from Descartes, we get Cartesian dualism. So Descartes version of dualism. And this has been the most, uh, uh, the, the more preponderant, the most uh, influential, excuse me, idea of dualism that has been formulated yet in Western, in Western philosophy, most would agree. Okay, so there are two things we have to exist with, um, we have to think about here. Firstly is um, the idea of dualism. And what we can do that, well, what we can do to understand that is to do Descartes' doubting exercise, which you get in the Meditations, his famous philosophical works. So what Descartes does is goes through a kind of exercise and sees what he can doubt. Um, now I can do the same thing right now. I can doubt the existence of the video camera in front of me, just as you can doubt the existence of the computer screen in front of you. I can doubt the existence of my glasses. I can even doubt the existence of my nose. I can doubt the existence of my eyes. And then Descartes says, well, what can I not doubt? What is undoubtable? In other words, what is indubitable? Indubitable. And he says, the only thing I can't doubt when I'm doing all this doubting, the only thing I can't doubt is that I am doubting. <laughs> In other words, the only thing I can't doubt is my thought, my thoughts. So the only thing Descartes says we can't doubt is that we have a mind, that we have consciousness, that we are thinking things. This is indubitable. This cannot be doubted. But what is this mind, this consciousness? It's something that cannot be weighed. It can't be seen. doesn't occupy space. This contrasts with the other kind of thing that exists, which is matter. Matter has space. It can be like uh, this teddy bear. It's soft. Um, it has different. It is. It has different qualities. We can say it's brown. It's flexible. It weighs a certain amount. It exists in a certain period of time. It was made three years ago and will exist for another fifty years. This kind of thing. Now the difference is. I can doubt the existence of this teddy bear that I'm holding in front of me and you can doubt the ex its existence too. Um, I might be having a dream, I might, have, might be hallucinating, I might have a bad fever and be seeing things, I might have taken some LSD, um, there might be a monster or a demon that has um, put me in an, uh, like an alternative or virtual reality machine when things that aren't real appear real to me. So even if I or you are in a virtual reality machine or if I or you are, de uh, are dreaming, 
The only thing we cannot doubt is our own thoughts, our own mind. So there you get the two kinds of things, mind and matter. And that's what we refer to as Cartesian dualism. Um, the next and less important for our purposes, for our anthropologist's purposes, but worth dwelling on for a little bit, is the idea of wax. Okay, so I've got wax here and a candle once I get focused. <laughs> Camera doesn't want to focus, doesn't like it. All right, um, so this thing I'm tapping now is a hard thing. doesn't smell of much. Um, I can crack it off bits. Uh, it makes a sound when I tap it. It's sort of beigey and it has a certain weight. Um, now also, if I bring this close into the camera, I can pour some out on my lecture notes and you'll get um, a liquid. It's a liquid running down here. And also, I'm not sure if you can see, probably coming up through this, the camera, you can also see some gas and smoke. Now Descartes says, I know all these things are wax. This smoke is a form of wax. This liquid is a form of wax. And this hard thing in front of me is a form of wax. But I can't know that from perception. I don't, I cannot perceive, uh, I cannot perceive the connection between them using my senses alone. He says it's only through the understanding, through uh, our mind that we perceive. We can, we partly perceive through our, you know, eyes, um, nose, through our taste, through our hearing, through our sense of touch. But the thing that puts it all together is understanding. And that idea uh, is rationalism. It's called, is, is an example of what's called rationalism, where you put, put thoughts first. That the, the idea is that thought and ideas come first in the production of knowledge. That's to be contrasted with a later philosophical movement the response to this, there were a variety, a variety of responses. One was the um, empiricists, the British empiricists, Locke, Barclay and Hume, who said, no, actually our knowledge comes from perception. We're born like a blank slate and we, we achieve knowledge by sensing things. And then we have other responses by other philosophers such as Kant and later Merleau-Ponty. But for the main, for the, the point right now is that um, Descartes' idea is that thoughts come first in the production of knowledge, in gaining knowledge, in achieving knowledge. So we've got two kinds of ideas here. One is um, dualism, that's more interesting to us. The other is rationalism, which is less interesting to us. So just to recap, um, for Descartes, if you slice open my scalp and my cranium and you go beneath the bone and you pick out this thing, all you'll have is grey matter there. You don't you don't have me. Um, what you have there is no difference to this teddy. But here's one difference. If I squeeze my cheek, I start to feel pain. If I squeeze this teddy, teddy feels no pain, according to Descartes. I feel pain, teddy doesn't feel pain. When I say I feel pain, the I I'm referring to is something you cannot see, and I cannot see either. You cannot see, it's not my face. If you cut open my scalp and my cranium, it's not my brain, it's something else. It's an immaterial thing that cannot, that you cannot perceive. I only know it myself through thinking. So the only thing I can really be sure of is my own mind. And same with you. You can't actually be sure that I'm thinking. Um, but that takes us down another road in philosophy, which I don't want to cover now. So the main thing is that a uh, brain is not consciousness. It's your mind. So when Descartes says, I am, I exist, the I he's referring to is the consciousness, it's the mind, it's the thing which thinks, the thinking thing as he calls it, the indubitable. Um, we can doubt our body, we can doubt our brain, we can doubt the wax, we can doubt the teddy, you can doubt the computer screen, but you can't doubt your doubt, you can't doubt your own mind. So. The answer, one of the philosophical responses to this, as I mentioned, was the empiricist, the British empiricist, Locke, Barclay and Hume, there's phenomenology. But another way of responding to this, just out of interest, is materialism. This, took, this takes different forms, but the idea is that matter is the predominant, is the most um, basic element, if you like, in the universe, not thought. The matter comes first. And 
like in the 50s and 60s, there were philosophers who, and then later, who talked about the possibility of computers gaining consciousness. So I said, like, if I squeeze me, if I squeeze my cheek, I feel some pain. If I squeeze this teddy, Teddy feels no pain. But in theory, if I melt down Teddy and get all the precious metals and iron or whatever and make a circuit board, I can make this thing, according to scientific materialism, into a computer um, circuit board which can feel pain. According to Descartes, that's impossible because there's something in here or around me, I don't know exactly where it's supposed to be. Descartes had a theory, but it doesn't really matter. There's something around me that is mind. And Mind is somewhere around me, but not in Teddy, nor in this candle. As much as I tap it, it's not going to hurt. Different if I tap this, it starts to hurt. And similarly, uh, this piece of paper. No matter how hard I squeeze, I can even rip it. It feels no pain. If I try and rip my cheek, <laughs> then I will feel pain. So um, Descartes will, uh, had this theory of two kinds of things, mind and matter. Materialists such as like Dennett in Brainstorms argues that no, um, what you what Descartes talks about as thought develops out of matter. Um, another problem uh, with uh, Cartesian dualism is what's called the problem of interactionism. That is, if Descartes right that I have matter and I have mind, my body is the matter that's associated with me and there's something else, an ethereal other substance, which is my thinking thing. If, if Descartes is right about that, how do we account for the fact when I squeeze my cheek, I feel pain? If matter and mind are so radically different, how do they interact with each other such that I can move my fingers when I want to, I can make a an okay kind of sign, an okay kind of sign, when I want to. How does thought turn into matter? Or how does matter such as a pinching my cheek turn into thought and feeling such as pain and discomfort? Um, this is supposed to be a huge problem for Descartes' theory. Now these are sort of the philosophical implications. And I said, I'm not a philosopher. I can't really um, talk about this. And there's a lot of much better stuff on the web. What, I, what I'm more concerned with is what it means for anthropology. Now, pre-World War II, anthropologists would go to, like, let's say, look at um, Trobrian magic, magic on the Trobrian Islands, or magic in Central Australia amongst the Aranta Aboriginal people. And they would say, oh, you know what's going on here? These people are a little bit ignorant, possibly, or not so ignorant, but... In any case, they have melded or confused mind and matter and put it together. So when they're doing, when they're thinking of magic, they think that their thoughts have some sort of control over the material world, which they cannot. So what these anthropologists did was say, okay, these societies meld these two categories. Um, now, in the post-war period, we have anthropologists who will look at later, such as Hallowell, looking at the Ojibwa, uh, around the Great Lakes of um, North America. The Ojibwa, for example, feel that uh, a, um, a, an animal, uh, ostensibly an animal, a bear, can be a kind of person. And therefore, that bears become kind of thinking things. Now, according to Descartes, that's impossible. Animals don't have thoughts or feelings. Controversially, he argues this. Animals don't have mind, he said, whereas the only things that have mind are humans. Uh, most people these days would disagree with that. Even most dualists would disagree with that. But along comes Hallowell and says, well, according to the Ojibwa Indians, uh, bears are also persons. They're also thinking things. Okay, so that, that's okay. But as we go further on, in the last few decades, we have um, anthropologists like Viva Iros de Castro and his followers who are saying, look, even the, the whole dualistic perspective that Descartes has initiated in Western thought is untenable, it's wrong, and in any case, it's not going to help us to understand these different cultures. And another sort of form of critique comes from the idea of embodiment, which I've done another YouTube clip on, but I'll discuss later in more detail too. So that's the kind of anthropological response to it. 
So what is the relevance then of Descartes? Well, he still is very Descartes, is very relevant. I mean, he presents what is probably the greatest formulation of dualism. I've been told that this, that his uh, theory of dualism really is the starting point of modern philosophy and even modern science because he separate, separates out matter as something to be thought of as not imbued with spirit but as something um, separate from spirit and to be experimented on and engaged with, with technology. Um, and in many ways it still predominates in our thinking, even people who try to say, if they say, oh look, I believe mind and body are connected in, in you know, really beautiful ways. Well, in a sense they're still talking about mind and body and they're still talking about the sorts of things that Descartes that they're still talking in terms of the distinction that Descartes actually um, gave us. So we're forced to engage with Descartes basically, and most anthropologists have, have chosen to engage with him uh, in a critical way, saying his way thinking is not very useful. Um, from philosophical perspective, again, I'm not the expert, but there's a whole lot of responses from empiricism, from phenomenology, from materialism, the problem of interactionism, how mind and matter interrelate. But the main point here is that dualism, uh, when anthropologists talk about dualism, we're talking about the idea that there are two kinds of things, mind and matter, um, and most anthropologists have critiqued this recently.